restless are restless beings. So it's it's very difficult for you to I understand to actually come to that moment where you say this is what I actually wanted, and you are at peace with that. When is it basically? Well, in this project, uh, very soon, because right away in the first month only, I knew this is what we have to do, I wanted to do. And uh, my problem was I had to send it to the client, and the client had a very high-powered firm of consultants who, who specialize in laboratories. And the last thing they want to see is rubbish like this with curved walls. They want these boxes. But I was very, very lucky that in their thing, there was one person who understood the importance of having the gardens. It's so important. In fact, I thought if I ever got cancer, I would like to see a Brazilian rainforest. I would want to know that nature is fecund. In fact, the other day, someone told me that the Parsi General Hospital down here has a garden. Is that right? And, and, and the idea of a hospice having a garden was basic in Europe. And now the poor patients in other hospitals are walking up and down in the corridors, <laughs> falling over each other. But in the Parsi General Hospital, you can walk around the edge of the garden. So the thing that to use, um, to, you know, it was very, very important. If they had turned it down, they could easily have said, no, I'm sorry, this is too. But, this, but what we have done is put a rectangular buildings inset behind with, and the leftover spaces, it's yin yang, became gardens at different levels. So it worked very fast, very well. Actually, we went there, I saw the site in um, 2007, April 2nd, I think it was, it was our wedding anniversary. I didn't want to go there, but they said, you must come. So we went there, we had to leave a day early. And then it opened in um, October 5th, 2010, in three and a half years. And that's why it was two and a half years or more of construction. But luckily, you have a we had a very good client, those two people you saw, Jean and Leonor, and they were willing to take a risk. That's very, very important. I think, uh, I, think I, I liked Ahmedabad much better than Bombay in terms of clients because the capitalists in Bombay are bourgeois. They don't take risks. The ones in Ahmedabad are venture capitalists. I mean, they're closer to that. They take risks. And art is taking risks. In fact, I think Cocteau said, when your friends tell you it's perfect, stop. That's when the true artist takes a chance. It's a completely different thing. And that's what upsets me about the young architects today. What are they battling clients who are so stupid? They bring a third-rate firm from abroad, and they ask the local architects, will you, will you get these plans through? And, the, 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 and the, but really, we have to protest, in fact, because there's no one like Pupil Jaika around. We have to, you may be, may be the new Pupil Jaika. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, Rashmi, I think it's a serious problem for our cities, for our architecture. There is, in fact, I think uh, Kasturba, uh, Kasturbai Lalbai, who was uh, a very good patron for Doshi and myself and Kanvinde too. One day Doshi had done some house or something, and they had to break a wall or something or a window. So he had to take Kasturbai to the site and he said, uh, we'll have to break or to change this window. And Kasturbai was a very dour chap. He looked and looked and he said, you are learning at my expense. <laughs> <laughs> so Doshi came and told us that I had a very good friend, Praveena. I don't know if any of you knew Praveena Bhaji. Praveena said quite dryly, she said, well, somebody has to pay the <laughs> price of social progress. It might as well be the rich. <laughs> you know, and this makes the rich don't take that responsibility today. That's huge, that difference. And it'll show itself in every way in films too. We don't have anyone who's rich enough that they can afford to be on the cutting edge of music or something. They want to just play it. That's why Bombay was never a good place for new architecture. Because the, the business people here were always quite um, safe. I mean, the Ahmedabad, Surat, and all, there's more energy in them, I think. I may be wrong. Uh, my name is Mihir. Uh, I'm a student. I, uh, I was very curious to know whether what would have happened that day uh, when you went to Lisbon for a walk and uh, had it not rained. 
And, uh, had you been right till the end? It's, like, it's, it's, it's worse than that. And they told me that they didn't know where the key was. And then afterwards, they told me, after the building was going up, John told me, I, we didn't want to tell you, but we didn't own the site at that time. <laughs> God. So they were just having me on. They wanted to see what designs I... But that's, I mean, it's, I, think, I think anything like that is a venture, it's a, it's a risk you take, and, and you have to build the momentum. In fact, one thing very good in India, as a young architect, I'll tell you that, in India, you know, part of your responsibility is to create the conditions under which you can function. You don't have a support system of someone to help you. You must establish with your client, where you're building a small house or a huge thing, in which they, they learn, you learn to trust each other. So I think if I hadn't worked in India, it would have been more difficult. Because uh, abroad, actually, people, architects don't do that at all. They get a program, and they get a site, and they just design some facades, and it's over. But in India, I think it's, it's really much more like architecture used to be in the 20s, 1920s, 1930s, that um, the architect has the responsibility of, of um, and you know, I don't know how to put it. It's it's not that you have to you have to uh, uh, bully the client. Not at all. You have to carry them on, and then they will come up with much better ideas. Many of those ideas there were these other people, the scientists and stuff. I've done a project in in Pune, you know, for for Narlika, that Ayuka. I thought that we should make it a model of the cosmos, but today's ideas. But all the ideas came from them. The scientists, they were so excited by that. So every human being, I, I think, is, is inflammable. In fact, I used to often think that, well, let me start. I think someone like Gandhiji was self-igniting. <laughs> you could put him down anywhere, and he'd start thinking, what the hell's going on? Why can't I do that, etc." I think that someone like Nehru was a great man, was not self-igniting. He had the most expensive education in the world, and not a single professor of his remembered him. That's bad news, <laughs> especially in the British system where they have one-on-one -on -one relationship. But I'm sorry I'm hurting people here, but I think he was inflammable. So when he heard someone speak, and he had so many, very Elvin or Homi Baba, he caught fire. And he said, we must do that. And the third kind of client is asbestos. Indira Gandhi was asbestos. I think who we have in Delhi is asbestos. And you can't do anything with asbestos. You can't. You can't, really. You can just hope that they'll be inflammable. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, I'm Jaydeep. I'm a student of architecture. Uh, you're building Bharat Bhavan and the Champalimont Center. Both happen on the same principles. Uh, you also mentioned that the expression should be contemporary of the building. So how do you explain the term contemporary in these cases? So what would be contemporary? You mean whatever, whatever, the line, whatever is the language you're using at that time. I mean, I didn't try to make it gothic because that's what they build in, 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 uh, in uh, Portugal. Surely you understand that. Which yes. year are you in? I'm in the fourth year. Okay, you what? should know that. Yeah. Come on, you know what contemporary means. Yeah, yeah come on. Don't duck the issue. The issue is that it's, it's considered that you make, a, as I said, a cartoon version of the past, which, is, which Mario Miranda can do, uh, of Goa, because he is a cartoonist. <laughs> but we are not. You must understand that. Anyway. All right, okay. Sir, so, uh, my question is uh, to architect Korea. Sir, I am Mandar, I am an architect. And uh, there's this very interesting thing which I noted here. There were two different experiences that we could uh, feel from the, the film, rather. Uh, one was primarily for the people who were, the project was 50% for the public and 50% for the people who are resident patients. If I'm a patient in this institute, uh, would I be able to come out into the open space where the 50% public area is? That I couldn't understand from the film. So, yeah, sir, yeah. Can you? Of course, first of all, there are no patients there. It's a, it's a, it's re, it's a radiation. So they go. They, the the whole thing takes two minutes. It's it's not invasive. I mean, they do it all with CAT scan and stuff. So it takes two minutes, and then you go home. There, there's no it's, overnight. It's not stay. a lie-in hospital. It's not a lie-in hospital. 
but of course you can come out and walk around yeah so could the building be more porous uh, is this uh, a valid kind of a query no, could the building called, be more porous no you don't want patients walking out and knocking being knocked on by a bicycle or something <laughs> i mean you have to stop and think about no, the sir, i'm talking yang. about the uh, medical staff the other people who are working oh they've got ways of leaving of course they've got gardens and they can get out step out of the garden into into in fact that last triangular garden you saw you know the sunken one yeah pointed that leads directly to the par parking lot and stuff and in fact i was there for the opening and i fell and broke my hip and so i had to stay on there but then went in the opening i was in a wheelchair and stuff and um, it was quite interesting that you know in in a place like spain or portugal because of the bullfighting i think they have a great sense of primordial things like blood and stuff so that, i mean i was a victim of my own building the first victim so they really liked that they felt that a real architect would fall get hurt by it because i suppose in the old days if a, if a building was opened some blood was shed either a chicken or the architect or somebody so the fact, so the, this is really important because you can relate to people that's what's lovely about india no people immediately can relate they're not like yeah yeah the idea of some primordial memory stirs in your head i think But this connect didn't probably i didn't note the connect in the film that's what i wanted to point out that the no, film probably i like you to just that thing was about left. the the unfinished shapes yes yeah that's very important yeah you know the the so called ease of the lines and the grace of the space of course is apparent but there is something you know like which uh, of course charles mentioned that there's an enigmatic object at the end of the pathway but the whole space itself is like an enigmatic object you know and that's the thing i mean you can try even now you've just seen the images you've seen two versions of the images still images and moving images can you encapsulate what you've just seen into something like a concrete memory and you'll find that it's slipping out there's something so enigmatic and something beyond uh, you know easy intellectual comprehension in that space and that's one of the things which i also tried to see through the camera the space as an enigmatic object and to transfer you know my my experience of that enigma uh, to the viewers because i feel that you know when charles is talking about a non building you know non building can be looked at in a very uh, you know sort of banal way by just talking about it as a as a landscape you know which is not inhabited or encapsulated or some such thing like that but actually a non building is a place which you can't see and the place which you can't see is is a place which you can't actually understand because you can you can most probably look at it but you can't see it and that and the way you don't see uh you know the mountains which you are confronted with you know and suppose you have a you have a window which which looks at a mountain how long will you look at i mean you can keep looking at it forever but you can't ever get it there's something which escapes you that quality you know which nature has inherently is what you know i really feel charles managed to get here and in so many other buildings where there's a continuous defeat of the intellect and then something else takes over you know we couldn't talk about all these things in the film because it's really difficult to <coughs> explain it even right now i don't know whether i've been clear enough but it's a, it's a subtle thing which you might get or <coughs> but the reason is that you don't understand the form you no know? just when it's going it steps down then it goes up and then other places are, yeah so how do you complete the form is it incomplete and after some time as you said you are defeated <laughs> and you just accept it and at that point it becomes serene that's what he said yeah and the i mean 
you need beauty, there are all kinds of beauty. You can have a beauty which is very sort of uh, like a stated beauty. But here, you know, there's something where like there is an effort that you have to make to complete like any picture that you're seeing, that unfinished quality. So, the, the, I mean, you are part of the, of the, of the beauty making process. And, and therefore, it's, it's unique to every person. Like, I, I hope, I mean, all of you managed to go there and see it. But otherwise, I think this film is quite enough. <laughs> And, and it interpenetrates with two great enigmatic objects, which is the sky and the ocean. You know, I mean, like the sky is the ultimate enigma, you know, however much you look at it. And the ocean also, which keeps changing form and color and everything. So, and the sight changes form and color with the change of sky and the ocean. So the enigma continues, you know, people just go there and just sit there. And they sit there because it's a place which doesn't bore them. You can't get bored out there because it's so vital and it's so changing all the time. You know, it's like if we were lucky or unlucky, whatever you call it, like we caught it in two modes, like bright sunlight and, and dreary, cloudy, rainy uh, light. But there are a thousand moods in between, which I missed because I was there, but the camera wasn't there or the cameraman wasn't ready or the camera was shooting somewhere else and I just passed it and I said, oh, I need this. By the time you run and you come back, it's gone. Yeah, uh, uh, this is Dhawal here. And uh, it's just a comment uh, uh, because... Uh, uh, this is Dhawal who worked on the project, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've, I've worked with Sir for a long time, uh, though short compared to the life of work that he's done. But uh, uh, I just want to share the some sort of profound, uh, you know, idea or things that uh, that we've come across during discussions with Sir. And something that I really like that architecture and film brings together is where he said that, you know, you can't speak a statement with just adjectives. There has to be other words which are noun, verbs, is, the, you know, so you can't say that there are just glimpses of images which make a beautiful building beautiful. So why the column there or, uh, you know, what is the meaning of that thing just there? It's, it's not that. It's the journey, it's the experience and the entire statement that the whole thought process made. And, uh, you know, something that was, and, and the clarity of mind, the clarity of mind that the way you begin the process, the line you take, the feeling you have at the day one on site, you carry it through your entire journey of process clearly uh, brings about this kind of a product. And I think rather than analyzing every single element and then wanting to know an answer of, I think what Sir said really nice was where you take, he, he understood the elements that made an experience in a particular era and he sort of brought that down into his definition of his elements and made the building. And I think that's what we need to do, rather than analyzing and being critical about every part, we sort of try, we just sum up and understand the experience and then make our own definition and narration through our work and our architecture. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add one thing to that. What I said to Dhawal um, is something which was actually written by a great architect called Louis Sullivan in the 19th, 18th, 19th century in Chicago. And uh, he, he was... Uh, he was a wonderful architect, but uh, in his office was the young Frank Lloyd Wright. And they got on very well. And he wrote a th book called Kindergarten Chats, which you young architects should read. It's imaginary conversations between the master and the pupil walking around Chicago. And they're wonderful things. Like, for instance, one of the things is they look at a building. And um, uh, Sullivan says, you know, this building consists only of adjectives and exclamation signs. <laughs> And he said, a building is a, is a, has to have syntax. It's a sentence. It has to have a beginning and end. It has to have verbs. 
And that's what you see in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright or Corbusier, or what you see in Graham Greene or something. They construct it because, because it's, it's quite a different thing. And I think that's very, very important that, that we realize. <laughs> because I think another thing he says, which is very, I think, also quite scary, he, he's look at some terrible building. And um, again, one of these things which are just put up and photographed. And, he, and they both dislike it. And uh, uh, Wright says, the student says, I think this man, ran, the architect, ran away to Paris. <laughs> and, and, and Sullivan said, oh, no, he's right there. <laughs> he said, whenever we build, we are saying something about ourselves. Whenever we speak, whenever, whatever. And I think that should be on. And that what goes from construction becomes architecture. That's what takes writing into literature, anything, on and on. It's very, very important. But try and read that book. It's called Kindergarten Chats. You'll probably get it on the, on, on the net. No, no, no. It, it, it went very, very smoothly. Of course, we tried different things, but all within a certain context. It's like, a, like anything else. You try a different path, you come back, sometimes you continue. But again, I keep saying that it could never have happened unless the client was willing to um, back me up. For instance, this thing that he just spoke about, the, the cutting of the shapes. I mean, if I tell them I want to cut it for it to look enigmatic, they think I'm crazy. They say, how much is it going to cost me? <laughs> but they didn't question me. They may have guessed it, but it doesn't cost any extra. But they trusted you. That trust is so important. I don't know if it exists today for young architects or even middle-aged ones. But uh, I think the whole process is so ugly today. It's all marketing.